Okay. Welcome to Extraordinary Wildlife in Your Backyard, uh, Season 1, Episode 12, The Hills Have Mycorrhizae. Uh, first of all, plural mycorrhizae, it's kind of like a word like moose, I think, and mycorrhiza, mycorrhizae, I've even heard mycorrhizas all work out. It's, it's complex, just like the relationship. Um, but this was an incredibly fun, and to be honest, a total mind-blowing topic to explore because I always kind of sort of knew what mycorrhizae were, but only in a basic, fuzzy, blurry way. And the more I learned about this relationship, uh, which by the way is one of the most important relationships on the planet uh, between plants and fungi, my mind just started twisting and turning with all of this insane, mind-blowing, mind-altering information it was receiving. Uh, and I, I, I don't mean mind altering in a way you might think one's mind might be altered in a relationship with fungi. Uh, but first, uh, let's draw your attention to two new videos produced by the esteemed research communication intern, Elizabeth Gamillo, who's joining us today. It's been an incredible honor to work with her this summer. She's a former student of Chris Young, who I'll also mention in a bit, and she's an excellent science communicator and uh, fresh out of college has produced 18 articles for Science Magazine's website. And uh, you can watch a couple of her recent and fabulous how-to videos. Uh, one of them is currently on the UEC In My Backyard website about how to make a dragonfly planter. It's super cool. Uh, from last week's Dragonfly Blitz. And the second video is available on the UEC's Facebook page about three easy ways to press plants to preserve them for their scientific or aesthetic value. So this is a great naturalist skill to learn. And um, the reason the plant press video uh, was made was to help kick off what Ethan already mentioned, the Yardversity Blitz. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this new initiative. It, it was actually the brainchild of Auburn University professor Chris Lepchek in partnership with the Urban Ecology Center. He's the first, we're the first group that he reached out to and then other organizations across Wisconsin and the country. And essentially, the, the goal of yard diversity is to both gain an understanding of the biodiversity that's in our backyard. Uh, and, and in case you're wondering, yard diversity is a combination of yard and biodiversity, hence yard diversity, the biodiversity in your yard. And it's also meant to engage all of us in the study of our backyards in a way that's easy and impactful. So if you think about it, almost all of the ecological research so far has and eco ecology is a pretty young field has taken place on large public and private lands and that makes sense especially when you're studying things like wolves and bison that need large acreage that you probably won't find in your backyard and we already know a little bit about what creatures we can find in our backyard because that's really the basis of these weekly talks on friday mornings but our backyards collectively make up somewhere between 50 and 100 million acres in the U.S. alone. And what we don't know very well is how this collective space, this collective backyard acreage is contributing to wildlife conservation. We don't know a lot about that. We, we love to study and learn about the big charismatic creatures like the wolves and the bison, but what about the species of insects that are ecologically important that can thrive in a postage stamp sized backyard or a patchwork of backyards? So with Yardversity, we'll continue to get a handle on the birds and mammals and plants that we already probably know pretty well through observations, but it also really allows us to start studying some of the lesser known and lesser studied creatures that we may not know are in our backyards um, and are just as, if not more important to understand if we're gonna look, start looking at our backyard through a lens of conservation. Um, the pollinators, the, the eaters of mosquitoes, the the critters that keep your plants and your soil healthy. With the adversity, you'll see how simple the process is and how you can be on the early side of, of what we really think is gonna be this kind of new frontier of ecological research, this, this huge collective ecological community uh, called our backyards. And as we mentioned earlier, the, the party starts today, to, today at four o'clock and Ethan Bott will introduce you to two important tools for your adversity, iNaturalist and eBird. Many of you are already familiar with eBird and how easy it is to use to track and monitor birds. Uh, but the heart of the Yardversity project is embedded in a platform called iNaturalist. Uh, 
It's a super easy to use app, easiest to use on a portable device like a smartphone or iPad, but can also be used with, with desktops or laptops and cameras. And essentially you open up the app, take a picture of something, submit it to the Yardversity project and iNaturalist helps you identify what you're looking at using image recognition software that Jenny brought up uh, with Seek. And then also, also other human users will peruse that database and provide verification. So let's say you're, you're ready to start cataloging the diversity in your backyard. You step out of your back door and this is the first thing you see. So some of you may already know what it is and some of you maybe don't. If you have no idea what it is, you could take a picture, submit it to the Yardversity project and move on to the next organism. But within a few minutes, maybe a few hours, maybe a few days, but usually pretty quickly, it's very likely that if you check back in, someone else in the Yardversity community will have ID'd it or helped, it, helped to ID it for you. And then you could put a name to this animal that you didn't have any idea what it was and then start researching it, observing it, and, and most importantly, understanding the animal yourself. What does it eat? What eats it? Why is it in my backyard? Why is it crawling up my computer screen? Is this a pest on my plants? Is this an important insect for conservation? Or is this something that we just don't know anything about? Um, so you could get all this information simply by taking that photo and submitting it. Um, you could also speed the process along by identifying the creature to the extent that you can. Like maybe, you know, well, I know it's an insect. Uh, or I think it's a butterfly, or maybe it's a moth. I don't know. Maybe I'll put it in the butterflies and moths category. You can idea to a level which you're comfortable and then let the iNaturalist community do the rest. And if you're wrong, it's no big deal. Your, your observation will be corrected, uh, or maybe you'll start a discussion or a fight um, on the real ID, and, and you can just kind of watch from the sidelines. But it gets better. Even if you have no idea what your organism is, uh, you, you click that button on the app and it will suggest an ID using that amazing image recognition software, uh, which is combined with an algorithm based on what should be seen in your area and what has recently been seen in your area. And so sometimes the app can only get you to order or family, sometimes it can get you to genus, and, but, but often it can get you to species. And, and this is where it really gets addicting. Uh, as Jenny mentioned, I told my wife I was going to go out front to take a few pictures and an hour and a half later I was still taking pictures in my front lawn trying to ID insects visiting my native plants and and seeing what others had to say so I encourage you to watch Ethan's talk at four o'clock today uh, and then tomorrow morning the official Yardversity kickoff blitz begins at 8 a.m. I'll be giving a short season summary of the first 12 episodes of this backyard series that began with the episode on house sparrows a few weeks after stay at home uh, and for each critter, I'll give a, just a three-minute synopsis and, and my favorite and most surprising bits of knowledge that I learned from each critter. Uh, then about from 8.45 or so, we'll have a check-in period. And at 9 o'clock, we'll all go out into our backyards to start collecting data. Um, the research team will stay on YouTube Live talking about some relevant topics like important things homeowners can do in their backyards, uh, national programs or certifications you can tap into, starting to introduce uh, the importance of native species and invasive species, all things that we'll uh, cover in more detail later when, when Kim Forbeck joins uh, for one of our monthly sessions. And so while you're collecting data, you can, you can kind of, if you want, keep us in the background like a radio as we're talking, uh, or if you have any specific questions while you're collecting data, you can ask us through the YouTube live chat function. And then we'll wrap up the morning with a quick look at what you all submitted that morning, uh, to get our first glimpse into this backyard ecosystem, followed by a trivia session with Danny Prudel. They're masters of trivia, and it's a fun way to wrap up the morning. And anyone that participates is eligible for a gift certificate prize that supports a local business, and all of our local businesses need our support right now. So once again, tune in this afternoon at 4 o'clock uh, to get yourself prepped for tomorrow, then tune in tomorrow for this collective, collaborative backyard wildlife monitoring that we'll all be doing together apart. And the final thing that I'm super excited to announce is, as I mentioned earlier, that next week I'll be on vacation uh, camping to celebrate my daughter's fifth birthday. And that's fantastic news for all of you because that means we'll have another fantastic guest speaker next week. Um, last week, of course, Maggie gave an incredible dragonfly damselfly talk. And then next week, Chris Young who coordinates the UEC's institutes, the UEC Institute's summer intensive and is an ecological historian, 
which are my two favorite things to study. Uh, he's an ecological historian at Alverno College, and he'll be giving a talk titled Meet the Naturalist in Your Own Backyard. The description of the talk reads, most of us would love to be accompanied by an expert naturalist every time we explore a new park or even our own backyard. There's so much to see and hear and also so much to identify. Across generations and even centuries, people have built networks of knowledge. Backyard naturalists continue these traditions today. Let's explore the naturalist tradition together and see if it leads to you. So super excited for next Friday's lecture. And now we will finally get to this thing called mycorrhiza. The word describes a relationship between groups of species. So it doesn't describe particular species. And this relationship is between a fungus and a plant. The word mycorrhiza is, de is derived from Greek. Mica means fungus and rhiza means root, which is the part of the plant where the relationship takes place. A quick look at our phylogenetic tree shows us some pretty cool things this week. All of the previous 11 episodes of this series were species represented in the animal kingdom, but now this mycorrhizal relationship brings us down two brand new roads, the fungus kingdom and the plant kingdom. And you'll notice that division line in this graphic separating the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes. And so far, animals, fungi, and plants are above that line on the eukaryotic side. But in two weeks, we're gonna venture below the line into the prokaryotes. So what's the difference? Quickly borrowing the slide from Ethan's dragonfly talk last week, we introduce a layer above kingdom. In our, in our biology classes, I think we all learned that you start with kingdoms at the top and work your way down to species, but biologists have an even broader division above kingdom called the domain. Uh, and most agree in the three domain system, which consists of archaea and bacteria, which are both prokaryotes and then the eukaryotes. Archaea briefly are single-celled organisms that were formerly thought of as a type of bacteria. So you may be familiar with the term archaebacteria, which they used to be called, and, and they used to be in their own kingdom, but that classification is now obsolete, and archaea are in their own unique domain. Uh, they are one of the most abundant groups of organisms on the planet and include some of the oldest species on Earth. They, they play important roles in things like carbon fixation and nitrogen cycling. And to bring it closer to home, whether you like it or not, they are an important part of the human microbiota, uh, particularly in the gut, the mouth, and the skin. They are also able to feed on inorganic matter and tend to dominate extreme environments like the hot springs of Yellowstone. Bacteria are also single-celled organisms, distinguished by the, the chemical makeup in their membranes and other characteristics. You probably are most familiar with the bacteria as they relate to humans, either the, the healthy and important bacteria in your gut, like acidophilus, or the bacteria that make us sick. And if you look at this slide, you'll see some familiar words like streptococcus of strep throat fame, Staphylococcus of staph infection fame, or salmonella of the food wasn't washed or cooked properly fame. Um, you also might have heard the term eubacteria, which means true bacteria, which was needed to distinguish the eubacteria from the archaebacteria. But when archaebacteria went away, so did eubacteria, and now we can just call them bacteria again, thankfully. So coming back to this original image, you'll see that the archaea and the bacteria are classified as prokaryotes. And prokaryotes are just defined as single cell organism that do not have a cell nucleus, mitochondria, or other membrane bound organelles in the cell. Eukaryotes therefore are defined as the opposite, organisms whose cells do have a nucleus and other membrane bound organelles. And that's where most of the life forms that we're familiar with reside, uh, including both of the partners in the mycorrhizal relationship, uh, fungi and plants. So let's start with fungi. Fungi take many forms. Uh, some are familiar like the mold on bread or the fruiting bodies we find in the forest or the kind that we like to eat. Some are less familiar because they're microscopic or hidden underground or they're in other organisms. So what makes something a fungus and not a plant or another type of organism? 
First is the presence of chitin in the cell walls, and chitin is also found in the exoskeletons of arthropods, uh, like a lobster or beetle. Second, they're heterotrophs, meaning they can't make their own food like a plant can through photosynthesis. And instead, they get their nutrition from other organic sources uh, using mainly plant or animal matter, using digestive enzymes, just like we do. Um, so this is a characteristic that fungi share with the animal kingdom. And finally, they're not mobile uh, other than through growth, although there are a few spores that are able to move through air or water. Whoops, here is the basic anatomy of a mushroom, which consists of the above ground portion that we're most familiar with, which is the fruiting body, and the below ground portion, which is the mycelium, and the individual strands of a mushroom are called hyphae, which you can kind of think of as functioning similar to roots of a to the roots of a plant. Uh, then we move on to the other half of the relationship, plants. And even though I think most of us know what plants are, uh, I found they were a little harder to define. And, and maybe Kim can weigh on this, but uh, because there's a lot of mosts involved when I was looking at this, so most plants do this or that. So uh, most plants are multicellular. Most plants obtain most of their energy from sunlight through photosynthesis. Uh, plants produce through sexual reproduction, and some plants can also reproduce asexually. And then finally, most plants produce seeds. So there's other ways of classifying plants, but this to me was made the most sense. And, and back in the day, uh, I read it was much easier to define plants because everything that wasn't classified as an animal was classified as a plant. So that was just way easier to deal with, but we've gotten more complex since then. In a mycorrhiza relationship, a fungus colonizes the root system of a plant, either externally or internally, through the hyphae. It's usually a mutualistic relationship in which both species benefit like we see in this diagram. The roots of the plant become connected and intertwined with the hyphae of the fungi, which then essentially function as extension of the roots of the plant. The plant usually supplies photosynthetic sugars to the fungus because they can make them and the fungus can't. And then the fungus supplies water and nutrients from the soil to the plant in a nice symbiotic interchange. Little quid pro quo, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And it's generally believed that it's the plant that initiates this relationship by signaling to the mushroom. There are two main types of mycorrhizal relationships based on the connection of the hyphae with the plant roots. So in endomycorrhizal relationships, the hyphae actually penetrate the cell walls of the plant. And in ectomycorrhizal relationships, they don't penetrate the cells, but they instead surround them. And of course, just because nature hates it when things are too simple, there's also ectendomycorrhizal relationships, which is like a hybrid combination of the other two. Technically, both the fungi and the plants are labeled mycorrhizal, so you have mycorrhizal fungi and mycorrhizal plants. And this is still a very poorly studied relationship, but it's interesting to note that early on, we thought mycorrhizal relationships were the exception to the rule, and that most plants didn't have the relationship. But today we know that it actually is the rule, as 95% of the plant families that we've studied uh, have some form of mycorrhizal relationship. So it's actually rare to find a plant that doesn't have a mycorrhizal relationship to some degree. And if you dig into your soil or if you transplant a plant or if you get a plant from a nursery, you can often see the yellowish, brownish, or whitish hyphae mixed in with the plant roots. Some families like orchids are obligate, have obligate mycorrhizal relationships. And so without the fungi, the plants even the seedlings will soon perish. Now, you may be asking, hey, Tim, I thought the whole point of a plant having roots was to take up water and nutrients from the soil. And you would be right. That is the function of the plant's roots. But the fungi can do it more efficiently usually. And there are some minerals, especially in certain soils, that the plant roots can't uptake, but the mushrooms can. And roots, roots usually, usually only work in the soil um, whereas hyphae uh, can tap directly into leaf litter or decaying wood or, or organisms and transfer those nutrients to a plant that would otherwise be unavailable. So 
yeah, it's a, it's a plant equivalent of, you know, I could paint my house, but I'm going to hire a professional to do it because they'll do it faster and they have access to better equipment than I do. Um, and as I mentioned before, some plants have lost the ability to rely on their roots alone and require the fungi to perform um, those crucial functions of mineral and water uptake. So as I mentioned before, it's thought that the plants initiate the relationship and it's usually in roots that maybe aren't doing so well, they're shorter or they're smaller or they're maybe in a part of the soil that's not producing well. And so they, they say, hey, I could use a little help here. And then the mushrooms respond to the signal by colonizing the roots. So if that's not a crazy enough concept by itself, which to me is, um, put on your seatbelt because like it just, it gets crazier and more mind blowing from here. In many mycorrhizal relationships, um, fungi just don't connect plant to soil, they connect plant to plant. They connect a beech tree to a beech tree, but they also connect a beech tree to a spruce tree. And ultimately, provided enough time and stability, you end up with this vast mycorrhizal network in which an entire forest is connected. A single tree might be connected to dozens of species of fungus, and a single fungus might be connected to dozens of trees or more. Um, so in this mycorrhizal network, it's like a highway network. And instead of cars and trucks, you have water, carbon, and other nutrients uh, traveling from plant to plant. And this was a revolutionary discovery that led to some of the craziest stories imaginable. For instance, uh, the traditional view of plants in a forest, uh, and one that we've all learned probably, is that trees and other plants are in this intense competition for sun, water, and nutrients. And the tallest trees are probably the strongest trees and are the ones that will survive in this Darwinian battle uh, known as survival of the fittest with winners and losers. Um, but ecologist Suzanne Samard, who has an amazing TED talk uh, called How Trees Talk to Each Other, discovered that competition isn't the only first force at work in a forest, and it may not even be the dominating force. But rather, uh, according to her, trees in a forest actually could be collaborating with each other in a sense to produce a stronger collective forest. Um, so in her research, what she did is she surrounded a birch tree with a giant plastic bag, securing it at the soil level. And then she injected a traceable radioactive carbon gas into the bag. And within one hour, she was able to trace that carbon in a nearby fir tree, an entirely different species. So in less than an hour, the birch tree took up the radioactive carbon, transported it to its roots, and then the carbon was transported to the nearby trees through the mycorrhizal network. So the fir tree needed the carbon, the birch had extra carbon, the birch sent the extra carbon to the fir tree. So instead of looking at this forest as this huge competitive battleground, and, and competition still is a, is a factor, but it's starting to act more like this the social, socialist network um, where, where riches and wealth are being redistributed. Uh, the healthy, strong trees, in a sense, are taking care of the weaker or smaller or even injured trees by shuttling re resources um, around this crazy mycorrhizal network. And, and, and if, if you, don't, you don't have to look at this through this like socialist feel-good lens, be, even though it's fun, um, because really this obeys the laws of physics and thermodynamics. When, when given the chance, areas of high pressure move to areas of low pressure to balance it out. That's what wind is. Um, if you drop food coloring in a bowl, uh, it'll diffuse until it distributes equally in the water. And essentially, that's what's happening with these mycorrhizal networks. The nutrients are moving from plants with high concentrations to plants with low concentrations. So in many ways, this whole system makes sense at a basic level but then you can still think about this forest as being this egalitarian society where uh, trees of different species are looking out for each other. Um, some studies show that a small tree growing in the shade of a larger tree can obtain up to 40% of its nutrients from the larger tree through this mycorrhizal network, even if that tree is a different species. So we usually look at that as a competition, and, and it still is in a sense, but, but what we're not seeing is that it's, it's more than a competition, it's actually this, you add this layer of collaboration or sharing of nutrients. 
Uh, and it's not just water and nutrients that pass from tree to tree. Trees can communicate signals with each other through this network. So if, if one tree suddenly comes under attack from an insect like this beetle uh, attacking a pine tree, the pine tree will naturally release its own defense enzymes to try to fight off the beetle. But then they also release these defense enzymes through its roots into that mycorrhizal network to neighboring trees, essentially letting them know that it's under attack. And as a result, the neighboring trees can produce higher concentrations of defense compounds, getting a leg up on this battle. Uh, so they'll be better prepared when the beetle spreads uh, through the forest to them. So essentially one tree under attack sends a warning to the other trees to help them better prepare for this uh, attacker through the mycorrhizal network. And, and, and it kind of acts like an immune system. And um, it's also been shown that the mycorrhizal fungi themselves will excrete defense enzymes, um, not against organisms that, it's, worry, that it's, it's worried will attack itself. It excretes defense enzymes against organisms that will attack the tree that they're partnering with. Um, so yeah, just, uh, and, and then we'll add another layer of fun to this. Sometimes when a plant is under attack from insects like aphids, it will release uh, VOCs, the volatile organic compounds that you probably maybe look at when you're getting paint or furniture. Um, the VOCs attract predators that will feed on the aphids that are attacking the tree. And because it's also signal it also signals the neighboring plants to also release the VOCs that it wouldn't um, because it, those trees aren't under attack yet. So the one tree is kind of amplifying its signal through these, this fungal network and then the whole forest starts attracting the predators to the aphids. Um, so think about that. Next time you're sitting next to a tree, like, uh, I don't know, maybe you think this is a tree, it's comfortable, it's providing me shade, but it doesn't really do anything. But I mean, just those, those last few stories, it's, it's talking to other trees, it's enlisting the help of other trees, it's being helped by this fungus. Um, and it's, it's enlisting the help of other insects even. So just that forest is talking in ways that we're not hearing. Um, crazy story number 714 there, there are instances where the mycorrhizal fungi recognize that nitrogen concentrations in the soil are getting low. And so I don't know how they do this yet, but they somehow are able to attract and kill and eat springtails. Um, so then they tap their hyphae into the springtail carcass and then send the nitrogen from the insects to the trees. So this isn't just something I saw on the internet. This is part of a study uh, by Kilaronomos and Hart. So you can look it up. Um, the pine trees in low nitrogen conditions took up 25% of their nitrogen from springtails that were lured by the mycorrhizal fungi and then killed. So I can't wrap my head around the, I haven't read the study yet, but it's like, it's, it's a springtail horror movie. Like, hey, don't go near that tree. The mushrooms are gonna get you and, and feed you to the tree. Tree, unreal. Um, crazy story number 814, in some cases, trees will have a percentage of their roots attached to mycorrhizal fungi and a percentage of them living free. So kind of like di diversifying its options and not putting all its eggs in one relationship. Uh, but evidence shows that in some cases, again, when nitrogen levels get too low, the fungi stop spreading the nitrogen into the tree and they kind of hang on to it for a while. Uh, and then this causes a response in the tree to be, to say like, Oh, my free roots are, well, I need more help. So the free roots then, then signal the hyphae to attach to them. And then more or sometimes all of the roots switch and you can, and they do this fairly quickly to the mycorrhizal relationship. Um, and then the hyphae release the nitrogen to the tree. So by hoarding the nitrogen and holding onto it for a little while, the fungi in a sense are saving the tree by causing its root system to become more efficient. Uh, in, a, in a low nitrogen environment. So again, nitrogen decreases, fungi stop sending nitrogen to the tree. The tree 
makes this change to increase the networks, uh, the fungi starts releasing the nitrogen again, and then the tree fares better. Um, I will, I'll send you the links and the, and the, um, and the, uh, whatchamacallits to all of these studies so you can look at them yourself because they're, they're just, they're hard to believe. Um, there's a, uh, a lot of stuff you should know about mycorrhizae and, and because of this, here's two, two books that are recommended um, to check out from the library or to add to your collection. Uh, the first is Mycorrhizal Planet, How Symbiotic Fungi Work with Roots to Support Plant Health and Build Soil Fertility. And the second is Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World. So let's uh, quickly kind of just consider and rehash a few final thoughts together. Um, First, so the mycorrhizal relationship might be one of the most successful and important ecological partnerships of all time. Second, plant roots can extend far, but mycelium can extend really far. In fact, uh, the largest known living thing on earth is a fungus in Oregon that extends over an area of four square miles and is estimated be to be between two and 9,000 years old where they came up with that number, but it's still incredibly old. Um, so a tree partnering with a fungus can really allow it to expand its roots, so to speak. Uh, third, this relationship between tree and fungus goes back, we think 400 million years to the time when plants first started spreading on dry land. So it's also one of the oldest relationships we know of. Um, and fourth, the mycorrhizal net network itself is delicate and, and can be disturbed easily, but it it can also regenerate rapidly, providing a forest with this, an enormous capacity to, um, to self-heal after a disturbance, provided the disturbance isn't too large. Um, and finally, I've, I've focused a lot on trees today, but again, mycorrhizal relationships are found in most plants, including some of our major crops like wheat, and uh, farmers can benefit from understanding and caring for the mycorrhizae in the soil, which include help with drought resistance and drought resistance and working as a, a natural pesticide and, and more efficient growth and yield. Um, so we'll, we'll end the talk with this fabulous video, which is the TED Ed version of the TED talk that I alluded to earlier. Uh, so I'll start this and you may need to um, adjust the volume on your screen but are on your computer device, uh, but here we go. Most of the forest lives in the shadow of the giants that make up the highest canopy. These are the oldest trees with hundreds of children and thousands of grandchildren. They check in with their neighbors, sharing food, supplies, and wisdom gained over their long lives. They do all this rooted in place, unable to speak, reach out, or move around. The secret to their success lies under the forest floor, where vast root systems support the towering trunks above. Partnering with these roots are symbiotic fungi called mycorrhizae. These fungi have countless branches that spread like hyphae that together make the mycelium. The mycelium spreads across a much larger area than the tree root system and connects the roots together. These connections form mycorrhizal networks. Through mycorrhizal networks, fungi can pass resources and signaling molecules between trees. We know the oldest trees have the largest mycorrhizal networks with the most connections to other trees, but these connections are incredibly complicated to trace. That's because there are about a hundred species of mycorrhizal fungi, and an individual tree might be colonized by dozens of different fungal organisms, each of which connects to a unique set of other trees, which in turn each have their own unique set of fungal associations. To get a sense of how substances flow through this network, Let's zoom in on sugars as they travel from a mature tree to a neighboring seedling. Sugar's journey starts high above the ground in the leaves of the tallest trees above the canopy. The leaves use the ample sunlight up there to create sugars through photosynthesis. This essential fuel then travels through the tree to the base of the trunk in the thick sap. From there, sugar flows down to the roots. Mycorrhizal fungi encounter the tips of the roots and either surround or penetrate the outer root cells, depending on the type of fungi. Fungi cannot produce sugars, 
though they need them for fuel, just like trees do. They can, however, collect nutrients from the soil much more efficiently than tree roots and pass these nutrients into the tree roots. In general, substances flow from where they are more abundant to where they are less abundant, or from source to sink. That means that the sugars flow from the tree roots into the fungal hyphae. Once the sugars enter the fungus, they travel along the hyphae through pores between cells or through special hollow transporter hyphae. The fungus absorbs some of the sugars, but some travels on and enters the roots of a neighboring tree, a seedling that grows in the shade and has less opportunity to photosynthesize sugars. But why does fungus transport resources from tree to tree? This is one of the mysteries of the mycorrhizal networks. It makes sense for fungus to exchange soil nutrients and sugar with the tree. Both parties benefit. The fungus likely benefits in less obvious ways from being part of a network between trees, but the exact ways aren't totally clear. Maybe the fungus benefits from having connections with as many different trees as possible and maximizes its connections by shuttling molecules between trees. Or maybe plants reduce their contributions to fungi if the fungi don't facilitate exchanges between trees. Whatever the reasons, these fungi pass an incredible amount of information between trees. Through the mycorrhizae, trees can tell when nutrients or signaling molecules are coming from a member of their own species or not. They can even tell when information is coming from a close relative, like a sibling or parent. Trees can also share information about events like drought or insect attacks through their fungal networks, causing their neighbors to increase production of protective enzymes in anticipation of threats. The forest's health relies on these intricate communications and exchanges. With everything so deeply interconnected, what impacts one species is bound to impact others. So trees can sound the alarm during an emergency, but how exactly do they defend themselves? Check out this video for the mind-boggling answer. So, um, that's the, the wrap of the mycorrhizal story.